blessing. We appreciate Brother Keith. He's been a great blessing to us, and I'm just glad that we have him here at Tri-State, and we're excited to have you. Well, we want to uh, just encourage you to open up your Bibles this morning. I always say this, and I think Doug does too. We hate when pastor's gone, but it always gives us the opportunity to preach, and so it kind of is nice. Uh, but uh, we love to be able to preach, and uh, we're excited to be here this morning. I just want to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Psalm, the book of Psalms in chapter number 19. The book of Psalms in chapter number 19. This is a, this is a, a chapter of the Bible that's probably familiar, uh, very familiar with uh, with many of you, and it's one that I really love and I like to, to look at from time to time, but I just think that the Lord has some uh, truth in here that will be a benefit to us this morning, and so we want to look at those things. Uh, you know, what this, the choir sang a song at the end uh, talking about Jesus is coming again. Isn't that a good uh, thing to know? Jesus is coming again. It's exciting to know that He's coming again, but one of the first or second songs that the choir sang, uh, it said that I know that I am saved. I know I've been saved. And you know, the only reason that that last song could be exciting to you is if you know what that first song is all about. If you know you're saved, then it's exciting to know that Jesus is coming again. Uh, But it can't be without uh, that fact. And I pray that everybody here today knows Jesus Christ as your Savior. And I hope that you know that one day when Jesus comes again, that you're going to be going with Him to live forever and ever in heaven. I hope that's what you know today. And you know, as a Christian, knowing that Jesus is coming again, one of the things that I desire in my life is that I live a life that is acceptable and pleasing to the Lord. And in Psalm chapter 19 and verse 14, uh, the Bible says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. And you know, that's my prayer for my life, and I hope that that's your prayer for your life. And I want to think about that thought uh, for a few moments this morning as we look into the Word of God. Before we go any further, let's pray and ask the Lord to help us with our time together. Heavenly Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to be able to be in the house of God this morning. We thank you that we have the Word of God, your inspired, perfect Word of God that you have given to us so that we can know you, so we can know who you are, what you're all about, and how that you would have us to live our lives. So we thank you that through your word, we know of Jesus Christ and how he loved us, how he loved us so much that he came and lived on this earth and he died on the cross for my sins and for all of our sins, Lord. Not because he had any sin, but he did it for us. He was the perfect lamb, the per- perfect substitute for us, Lord. We thank you for that. And we thank you that he didn't stay uh, dead, Lord, but they put him in a tomb and three days later he rose again and defeated hell, death, and the grave and is alive today, sitting at your right hand. We thank you so much for that, Father. And we ask you that you would help us to learn even today from your word how you'd have us to live our lives, how you'd have us to serve you so that we could uh, live our lives in a way that brings honor and glory to your wonderful name. We love you so much and we thank you. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. And amen. Amen. Well, we've already said here at Tri-State, we've had two great weeks of revival in our church. Many have come to know Christ throughout the last two weeks, been saved. And over the past three weeks, many Christians here have, have said that you have grown closer to the Lord. You said you've made decisions uh, with, with, in your life and you want to uh, draw closer to God and you want to live for Him in your life. Many have had a, their relationship with God strengthened over the past two weeks, and I'm excited about that. And you know, if we're all honest here today, we would, we would all say that we desire in our, that our lives would be lived in a way that would be acceptable in the sight of God. We want God to be pleased with our lives. Everybody here wants that. If you've come here today, then you're, you're saying that you want to do right. Or you at least want to know about what God is all about. Or otherwise you wouldn't be here. And you want to live your life in a way that would be pleasing to Him. And today as we think about that fact, and seek to, we want to seek to accomplish it with our own lives. It's an important desire that we have here today. And it, and it should be. Uh, we don't want some superficial, you know, only in word kind of desire to please God. Some people are like that. They say, I love God and I want to serve Him. But if you look at their lives, there's nothing in their life that would say or would, would, would back up that 
statement from them. There's nothing in their lives that shows that they really love the Lord and really want to serve them with their lives. We want something that is real, a real desire that draws us closer to God so that we can live our lives in a way that is acceptable in His sight, that brings honor and glory to His name, and in a way that when we finish our life, the Lord will look down on us and He will say, Well done, now good and faithful servant. That's what we want in our life. And so I want to look at Psalm 19 and think about those things for a few moments. Uh, let's look in verse number 1. The Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is, a, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the earth, heaven, and the circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid uh, from the heat thereof. Verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, the much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep me back, thy servant also, from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from thy great transgressions. Let the words of thy mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. As we look at this chapter, what we see is two things. The first thing we see is God's natural revelation to man. And what I mean by that, it's how God shows Himself to us just through the world around us. God shows Himself to us through the world around us. In verse 1, the Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God. When you walk outside, in just a little bit, and you look around, and you see the trees, and you see the grass, and you see animals going around, when you see everything that is around us, it all screams out that there is a God. It all, it all cries out to us that somebody created all this. And we know that that somebody is God. Last night, I stayed at the parsonage here to watch the pastor's dogs and they were gone. And uh, I had them outside and I saw something kind of back by the youth building. I, I was just curious what it was. So I walked over there and there were a couple of deer over there. And uh, I was watching them and I just kind of followed them. I was trying to get a picture, but I couldn't get close enough. They saw me. Uh, but I was following them and they were walking around. And finally, when they saw me, they took off running. They jumped over the, uh, the hillside and went down through the woods. And, you know, when I, when I think about that, that cries out that there is a God. Does it not? How could, all, how could those things exist? How could the, the, the grass and, the, and everything that is around us exist? How could we, in the, how we are, the way we're designed, how could we exist if it not for God? Yeah, you know, there's plenty of theories, right? There's, there's evolution and, and there's all these different things. But how much sense does that stuff really make? How, how much of, of those kind of things really speak to you in your life? How, many, how, many, how, how often have you read evolution, uh, the theory of evolution, and it, and it said, wow, that has changed my life. Now I'm going to be happy in my life. Now I, I know what the meaning of my life is all about. All that says is you're going to die soon. That's, that's, that's the end of that theory, right? It all came out of nothing, and then you're going to die soon. That's, that's what that theory is all about. But the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created all that we see. God created you and me. And the Bible says He created us in His image. And now we can have fellowship with God because He created us in His image. The heavens declare the glory of God. In verse number 2, we see it says, Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. You know, the creation 
speak, shares with us that there is God. It cries out, it declares the glory of God, but we don't hear it through an audible voice, right? We don't hear the tree saying, hey, God created me. Or that, when I tried to sneak up on that deer yesterday, it didn't turn around and say, God created me, see ya, you know. We don't hear it like that, right? We don't hear an audible voice, but it's, we see God in these things. We see Him in these things. Night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. You see, when we went to Africa last summer, we, we didn't have a, it was hard for us to communicate with the people. We had a hard time communicating with them because we don't know the language. We're going to go to Peru next summer. And when we go there, we're going to have a hard time communicating with the people because we don't speak that language. We can get by a little bit, but we really can't have a clear conversation with them because of the language barrier. But you know what? The creation has no language barrier with any person on the earth. It declares the glory of God to all people everywhere in this world. It speaks to everyone. In verse number 4, it says their line or their voice is going out through all of the earth. All the earth. And their words, the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Verse 5, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and is circling to the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Think about the sun for just a second. These last few verses talk about the sun, an aspect of the creation of God. You know, the Bible says the first thing that God did was let there be light, right? The first thing he said, let there be light, and there was light. Did you ever catch that the sun was created after that? Did you ever catch that? The sun, God doesn't need the sun to create light, but he created the sun for us. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing to see the sun. And you know, it it teaches us a little bit about God's creation as well. If you think about the sun, uh, it says here, in them have they set a tabernacle for the sun. You ever notice, although we know that the sun doesn't move, it, it, it appears to us that the sun is always in motion, doesn't it? It appears to us that it's always moving. It's kind of, you know, the tabernacle was a tent, right? It wasn't a permanent fixture. It was made so it could be taken up and moved from place to place. And, you know, as we look at the sun, we think about it moving. We, we talk about how it rises and how it sets. And, uh, uh, but, and we think about those kind of things. Uh, and it moves around. We think about, uh, in verse 5, it says, Which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. And rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. You know, uh, a groom, a bridegroom, uh, when he uh, is married and when he now has his wife, he comes out in the morning and he's excited. He's happy. He's rejoicing in what in his new bride. He's excited that of what he has. You know, in the morning when we we wake up, we know that the sun is going to be shining bright. We know it's not going to be dim one morning. The sun is always going to be shining like it always is supposed to. It's always there, always doing what God created it to do. It's never going to back up. You know, it's never going to just, we're not going to wake up tomorrow if the Lord hasn't returned and the sun all of a sudden go out. It it just does what it's supposed to do. It does, it it, it follows its order from creation. Verse 5 says, rejoices as a strong man to run a race. You know, when a man uh, gets ready to run a foot race, and he knows that he's prepared, he knows that he's worked hard, he's trained, and he's ready to go. When he gets ready to run that race, he's excited about it. He's excited about the potential to win that race, knowing that he has the ability to do that. You know, when the sun comes up, when it rises in the morning, we know that it's going to complete its course. We know the day is going to start and the day is going to end. The sun's going to come up, the sun's going to go down. We're going to have light and we're going to have dark. And it never quits. We know that that's going to happen. It happens over and over again. It says in verse 6, it's going forth from the end of the heaven and it's circling to the end of it. It continues to go on and on on this path forever, never stops. And then in verse uh, number 6, it says, And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Nobody can hide from the heat of the sun. You might close your eyes and say, I'm not going to look at it. And if I don't see it, then it must not be there. You can say that all you want. You can stay inside. You know, try to hide from it. But when you step out, you got your eyes closed, you got your sunglasses on, trying to hide from the sun, say, it's not there. When you get outside, the heat from the sun is still going to touch you, right? And you cannot deny that it is there. If you 
do not have your ability, uh, the ability to see for whatever reason, and you can't see the sun, when you walk outside, you're still going to feel the heat of it. You can't hide from the sun. You can't, you might be able to hide from me. You might be able to hide from, uh, you know, your work. Hope you don't do that. You might be able to hide from all kinds of things, but you can't hide from the heat of the sun. If you go under it, it is going to get you. You're going to feel the heat of the sun. That shows us what God is to us. He, the heavens declare the glory of God. And you know, that sun reminds me a lot of another kind of sun, S-O-N, the Son of God, of Jesus. You know that Jesus left heaven and He set up a little tabernacle here on earth. He wasn't a permanent fixture here on earth, but He came for a time. And you know, He got up and He was excited about doing the work of the Lord. He was on this earth and He said, I've come to seek and to save that which were lost. He said, I come not to be ministered unto, but to be, but to minister. He came to do the work of the Lord. Just like the sun, we always know it's going to rise and it's going to, it's going to set. When the Son of God came, there was no doubt that He came to do the work of the Lord. And He was not going to stop on that work. He continued to do it. You know, it says the sun was, continues on its course as a, on its circuit. The Son of God never never strayed off the path that God the Father had given him. He came to earth. He was born as a baby, born in that little manger. He grew up, even at the age of 12, was teaching those guys in the temple. You know, when he was about 30, he started his earthly ministry. He was performing miracles, and he was preaching to people, preaching them to repent. He was trying to warn them of what their sin was doing in their life. People rejected him. His own family didn't want to be around him. Uh, his hometown uh, rejected him and cast him off. He went all around. Some people followed, but many mocked him. And then the Bible says he went to the cross. You know, they put him before the, the courts. And they put him before the judges. And they said, he is guilty. What is he guilty of? Well, they just found some people to come and make up some things. And they said, he is guilty. We know he was innocent, but they claimed that he was guilty anyways. And they went, he went before the different judges. And, and finally, they sentenced him to death. And they put, they let him go, and he went the, uh, before the men who had those big whips. And they whipped him, and they beat him, and they mutilated his body. And then they, they mocked him. Uh, they stripped his clothes off of him, and just humiliated him in front uh, of all the world. They took that big crown of thorns, and as they mocked him, calling him the king of the Jews, they shoved that thing on his head, and as it pierced his brow, as blood ran down his body. And then they made him carry that big heavy cross up to the place where they were going to crucify him. And they laid him down and they, they nailed the nails through his hands and through his feet. And God, and, and, and Jesus, the Son of God, never stopped. He went through all that. The Bible says he could have called legions of angels to come and stop that all and take him home. Get him away from that. He didn't have to go through that pain and suffering that he went through, but he did it. For you and for me. He did it because He loved us. And He went through all of that suffering. He went through all of that pain. You might be sitting here today thinking, I'm in a lot of pain. I'm, I'm really tired. There's so much on me. There's so much that I have to go through. I just, oh, I don't have time to do this. And I don't have, to. and woe is me. He didn't go through anything like Jesus did. He went through pain. He went through true agony in His life. He did it because He loved us. And he never stopped until the task was finished. The heavens declare the glory of God. Just watching the sun reminds us of how Jesus, the Son of God, loved us so much that He came to the earth and died on the cross for our sins so that we could have a way to go to heaven. No one has an excuse. No one can hide from God. In Romans chapter number 1, in verse number 8, Romans chapter number 1, verse number 18, excuse me, we see this uh, again. Romans 1 and verse number 18, the Bible says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. For God has showed it, showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they 
or without excuse. The Bible says that God has made the things clearly seen. He has made the fact that He is present, that He exists, that He is alive, clearly seen, and no one has an excuse. God is clearly seen in our world. People, human beings, are the ones that that are making it hard to see. It's not God. It's us who are are talking about science and talking about uh, different philosophies and different uh, ideas. There's nothing wrong with science. Science is good. There's nothing wrong with these things but until we use them contrary to the Word of God. You see, science always matches up with the Word of God. It always does. You can spin it and you can turn it to make it say something different. But if you are true and honest to the things that, that, that science says, it tells us what it, 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 it agrees completely with the Word of God. And yet our world is talk, telling us about science and how it, how it proves that there's no God, how it proves that evolution is true. We hear different philosophies about how we ought to live our lives. Uh, humanism runs wild in our, world, in our society today. How we ought to live for ourselves. How we ought to do things that make us happy and that please us and that are going to advance us in the world. The Bible says we're supposed to live for Him. We're supposed to live for Him. And when we live for Him, that's when things are clearly seen. People are making it hard to see. People are making it hard to see. Man has rejected the light. Who's the light? Jesus is the light. Man has rejected that light. And without the light, isn't it hard to see? It's hard to see. Uh, It was a couple weeks ago in here, uh, during the service, it was storming outside and the power went off and all the lights went down. It got hard to see in here, didn't it? When you don't have light, it's hard to see. When you don't have the light of the world shining through the people, it's hard for them to see. It's hard for them to understand what is right and what is wrong. God has put it there. but we, Because man has rejected it, it's becoming really hard to see. But God has given us His natural revelation to us. But the next thing we see in this passage is God's written revelation to us. His special revelation that He's given us. It ought to be enough that we just see Him in the world. But He loved us so much that He gave us so much more. He gave us so much more. God gave us the Word of God. His Holy Bible. We know that the Bible was inspired of men. Of holy men. Uh, Men pinned down the words of the Bible, but God is the author. He inspired them to write. He gave them the words to write down. We know that this book is without error. Not one error in this Bible. We know that throughout the entire Bible, there are no contradictions. People will try to point out contradictions, try to show you this and try to show you that. But as you study the Word of God, you will see there's no contradiction. You can make the Bible say whatever you want. In Psalm chapter, I think it's 41 or 14, it says there is no God. The Bible says it in there. But if you take the whole verse, it says the fool says in his heart, there is no God. But people do that all the time. Maybe not that obvious, but they do things all the time to try to twist and turn the Bible to make it say what they want it to say. But the Bible, when you read it honestly and read what it says, it never has an error. It is never, it never contradicts itself. And it is the perfect and holy Word of God. Let's look at some of the characteristics of the Word of God that we see in this passage. In verse number 7, the Bible says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. You know, the Bible sometimes is called the law. We know in the Old Testament that the Old Testament uh, Jews had to follow the law. They actually had 613 laws that they were supposed to follow. And they were supposed to follow every single law. And what they found out real quickly is that they were not capable of following those laws perfectly. They weren't capable. But you know, the Bible says when Jesus came, He fulfilled the law. And no longer are we under the law anymore, but we're under grace. We're to follow Him. And so now our life, what we are to live after, is the Word of God. And living after what Jesus uh, teaches us in our life. And the Bible says the Word, the law of the Lord is perfect. Just like we said, it's perfect. There's no error. There's not one mistake in this book. And because it is perfect, the Bible says it converts the soul. Do you know, without the Word of God, you could not be saved. You could not have salvation You could not know God, and you could not spend eternity in heaven. Without the Word of God, we would all be doomed to spend our entire 
eternities in the lake of fire, in a place called hell. It's created for the devil and for his followers, for his fallen angels. We would all be there if it wasn't for the Word of God. That's where we'd be destined to be. If it wasn't for the Word of God, we might as well just forget about meeting in a place like this and just go on and live up our lives because pretty soon it's going to be over and we're going to suffer for eternity. But because we have the perfect law of the Lord, we know how we can be saved. And because we have the Bible, we, we learn of what Jesus Christ did for us. We learn of how much God loves us and we can be saved in our lives. We can have salvation in our lives. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, the soul. The testimony of the Lord is true. It's sure, excuse me, making wise the simple. We know that the testimony of the Bible, the truth of the Bible, it is sure. You don't, there are sometimes people will tell you something, you know, I'm sure that this is going to happen. Like, how sure are you? Well, 98%. Well, that's not completely sure, is it? There's still a chance that something else might happen. You know, or sometimes we might say, I'm 99.9% sure that this is going to happen. It leaves just a little bit of doubt, doesn't it? The Word of God is 150% sure. There's absolutely no doubt that what we have is the perfect truth of God. And because of that, it makes wise the simple. The simple. Those who don't know the truth. Those who don't know and understand how to live life and how what God is all about and how He would have us to live our lives. We don't know that apart from the Word of God. But because we have that perfect truth, because we have it, it's sure. We know it's right. We know how God wants us to live our lives. It makes us wise. Not a worldly wisdom, but a godly, spiritual wisdom it'll, it'll give us in our lives if we seek after it. You know, God is omniscient. That means He knows everything, right? He has all knowledge. Didn't you think it's crazy that God was able to give us, some, give us everything we needed for our entire lives in one little book? Isn't that pretty cool? You know, people write volumes and volumes of volumes of how to do this and how to do that. And it, they'll write book after book after book, and they still need to write more. You still need to update it. You still need to learn. But God gave us everything we needed in one small little book. And yet it lasts us. We can read this over and over and over again throughout our entire lives, and God keeps giving us more, keeps giving us more, keeps giving us more wisdom in our lives. And it's one small little book. I, I think that's fascinating. That, that's how, that, that just is a glimpse of, of the knowledge and the power that God has. The third thing is the statutes are right, rejoicing the heart. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. You know, the thing that the Bible gives us, it's not a rule book. The Bible is not a rule book. Yes, the Bible gives us things that we're supposed to do, and it shares with us things that we are not supposed to do, that God is displeased with if we follow them. But it's not a rule book. It's a guidebook for how to live our life. And when we follow that guide... We find rejoicing in our heart. We find true joy in our heart. That's where we find real satisfaction in our lives. Somebody here today might be looking for satisfaction in your life. You might be looking for real joy, real peace, real contentment in your life. The only place that you can find that is in the Word of God. The only place. You can't find it anywhere else. But the Bible says it's because... The statutes of the Lord of the Lord are right. They rejoice the heart. They bring us true joy in our life. If you want that joy, you've got to go after the Word of God. You've got to seek after it. The commandment, the Bible says, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. You know, there are a lot of different religions, religious books around the world. And a lot of those things, the one that I think of in particular is the Koran. There's a lot of a lot of evil in that book. A lot of a lot of a direction uh, to do unholy things and to do impure things. Things like kill the infidel. That's what the Quran says. That's, there's nothing holy about that. There's nothing right about that. But we know that our Bible, the Word of God, it is pure. It is perfect. There is not a blemish in it. It is a holy book, and because it's this holy book, it enlightens the eyes. In other words, it allows us to see what the world is really like. It allows us to see what God is really like. It allows us to see what we're really like in our depravity and in our failures and our problems in our life. But 
It also allows us to see how we correct those things in our lives as well and how we seek after God and to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The commandment is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Fear is a, in, in the Bible, we're talking about a, a respect. You know, and, and the Bible teaches us how to have respect, how to, how to have, be in awe of who God is and what He's done for us. And that's, that, that's, that, that's perfect. It teaches us how we're supposed to relate to God. And the fact that the Bible is perfect, it's right, it's pure, it's clean, and it, it's going to last forever and ever and ever and ever. When this earth is gone, the Bible is still going to exist. The Word of God is still going to exist. It's going to exist for eternity. And we get to be a part of that if we trust in Him. And the last one here, the last characteristic we see is the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. If I'm going to live after, if I'm going to follow something in my life, if I'm going to, if I'm going to decide this is what I'm going to live my life for, this is who I'm going to follow, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, I want to know that what I'm following is true. And what I'm following is correct. Have you ever tried to put something together and you didn't know how to do it, so you pulled out the instructions and you tried to follow the instructions, and when you got to the end, you realized there was an error in the instructions, and so it caused you to, to fumble around with putting it together, and maybe even caused you to break something or not to put it together right. You ever had that happen before? That's a problem, isn't it? It's no fun. You feel deceived. You feel like, I wasted all my time because this was an error. Isn't it good to know that the Word of God is true and righteous? It's correct. It's perfect. And it will lead our lives and guide our life perfectly on the path that God has for us. It will take us straight to heaven with our Savior. Isn't that good to know? The Word of God, this special revelation that God is giving us, is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Verse number 10, it says, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much Fine gold. There are so many things that we treasure in our in this world, in our society. We treasure things. We treasure money, gold. We treasure material possessions. We treasure our career. We treasure our family. We treasure our hobbies. We treasure our time, our goals, our desires. We have so many things that we treasure in our life. Everything I just mentioned, there's nothing inherently wrong with any of those things. You ought to love your family. You ought to do the best you can in your career and your job. If the Lord blesses you with money, amen. You know, use it. But we put those things first in our lives so often. But the Bible says the Word of God is more to be desired than gold, than treasures, than than your family, than your career, than anything else in the world. Because when you put Him first, then all those other things fall out the way that they're supposed to. You don't have to worry about your family when you have God first because you know how to take care of Him then. If you put your family before God, all you're doing is saying, I don't really love you like I ought to. Because you're not going to be able to provide for them the way you need to. You're not going to be able to teach them what you need to teach them. More to be desired. You know, if I, I used to say this when I started preaching. I talk about if we found out that buried right under the pulpit right here was like millions of dollars in gold. People, you guys would be like coming in here next week with shovels and pitchforks and uh, axes and everything to get down there and get that gold out of there. You want that. And we'd have a party. We'd have a big, we'd have a lot of people here that week, wouldn't we? We'd be packed out. We'd have both wings filled. We'd, we'd be in good shape. If we found out it was under the pulpit, everybody, we'd throw this thing out of here and we'd go after it. Isn't that true? Everybody's smiling. Everybody must know it's true, right? So you know where I'm going, right? You know where I'm going? It's on top. We don't need what's under it. We need what's on top. We need the Word of God in our life. More to be desired than gold. Sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. Sweeter than anything else on earth. Better than anything you could go after in this earth. The Word of God. The Word of God. If the Bible is such a treasure, we know it is, you all agreed with me just by your reaction to what I just said, then why do Christians not come to every service they can where the Bible is preached? 
Why do Christians not read their Bible every single day and seek God's face? Why do Christians not spend time in the Word of God? Or listening to the preaching? Why do Christians not come to Sunday school, hear the Bible being taught? Why do Christians not come to our special services, our revival meetings, when we bring in uh, the choice men of God, like Dr. Clayton Shumpert and like Dr. Ed Carter, and they preach the Word, they pour their heart out. Dr. Clayton Shumpert was, you don't know how bad his health was last week. He wanted to cancel, but the Lord wouldn't let him. Did you notice when he got done, all he could do was sit here and wipe his head and he couldn't hardly move? He wouldn't, go, he wouldn't go with us after the service to eat or anything. He just had to go home and rest. Did you know that every night he has a hospital bed at his home with a big piece of foam on top of that, and every night he goes from that bed to his chair all night long, barely gets any sleep at all? Did you know that he's had so many surgeries and that he is in constant pain in his life? Traveling hurts him. To travel here from South Carolina hurt him. But he came, he did it, because he had to preach the Word of God. He said, if I could preach for 24 hours, I wouldn't have to endure this pain anymore. Because I don't feel it while I preach. Word of God in our lives, it's right here for us. Why don't we seek after it? Why don't we read it every day? Why aren't we here? More to be desired than gold. And look what it does for us. This knowledge of the Word teaches us how to live our lives. It teaches us how to experience that joy, that peace. What more? Why would a man like Dr. Clayton Shumpert stand up here and go through such pain and agony and, and start tr- pain and problems in his life if it wasn't for the result of what he's doing in following the Lord? It's the joy. It's the blessing. It's the satisfaction that comes from serving God that drives that man. And it's the fact that he wants you to know what he has. That's why Pastor Tim spent so much time leading our church, preaching hard to teach us. That's why we spend our time in the Word of God, because we want you to have what we have. What was, I, when I was 15 years old and preaching, uh, people would ask me, why are you doing that? Why are you wasting your time doing that? Why don't you get a job that... Go after a job that makes you more money. Why would you spend your time at home studying to preach a sermon when you're going to be going out, hanging out with your friends, or, or playing basketball? Or the reason is because the joy and satisfaction that I get from behind, preaching the Word of God is like no other experience I've ever had on earth. Serving, the word, serving God is the greatest thing you could ever do in life. Greatest thing. You're missing out if, you don't, if you're not doing it. If you haven't given your complete heart to the Lord, you're missing out in your life. In ver- Real quickly, and we'll be done. In verse number 11, the Bible says, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who? It, well, first, the Bible warns us. It teaches us about problems and errors we need to stay away from so that we can stay close to God. In verse number 12, it says, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me thou from secret faults. There are things in our lives that we are doing that displeases God that sometimes we don't even know about. Does that still make it wrong? It does, doesn't it? it still dis- but when we get into the Word of God, God will show us these areas that we need to fix in our lives, not just so that He can say, I, you don't get to do that anymore, ha-ha, so that He can draw closer to us. It's, it's to draw, draw us closer to our Lord so we can have an even more personal, intimate relationship with Him. So we can be closer to our Father. He cleanses us from those things we don't even realize we're doing that displeases Him. Verse 13, Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. And let them not have dominion over me. When we get into the Word of God, it will give us the proper desires to stay away from sin, to stay away from evil, and to live our lives in a way that brings honor and glory to God. In a way that, 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 that helps us draw closer to Him. When you get a taste of God, you don't want to get rid of it. When you get in the Word of God and you get a taste of that, you'll experience something you've never experienced before in your life and you'll never want to lose it. And when you do lose it, if you do, if you fall away, if, you get, if, you, if your relationship with God gets hindered, if you allow things to come into your life, you realize it, don't you? You can look back and think, man, when I was serving the Lord, life was good. Now that I've fallen away, life's, life's a lot harder now. When we get in the Word of God, it will give us the right desires to draw closer to Him. 
draw closer to Him. It will keep us away from sin and evil in our life. And then verse 14, that very first verse we read when we started, it says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. I leave you with this question. Can you honestly pray the prayer of verse 14? Can you honestly pray that prayer? Here's what I mean by that. You can't honestly pray that prayer if you aren't seeking to live your life from the Lord. You can say it, but it's not honest, is it? It's like saying you love... It's like waking up every morning and say you love your wife, but then hitting her before you go to bed. It's just words, right? Just be words, right? There's no action to that. It's not real love. Say... To pray this prayer honestly, you have to be seeking after the Lord. Seeking to live. You can't honestly pray this prayer if you have sin in your life. If there is something in your life that you know displeases God, you must deal with it first before you can honestly pray this prayer. I challenge you to seek the face of God today. I challenge you to make it the prayer of your heart. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for being so good to us, Lord. We thank that you've given us your creation, which declares how wonderful you are. We know the Bible teaches when you created the world, that you created it with no problem. And yet, sin entered into the world through through man. And we've carried it on even through the day. But your heaven still declares the glory of you. And we thank you for that. Lord, but we thank you even more that you've given us the Word of God. That teaches us about you. It teaches us how much you love us. It shows us how you want us to live our life. Lord, help us to have the right desires to seek after you. Help us to live our lives in a way that brings honor and glory to you. Help us to be able to say, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. And that's our prayer. And that's what we want in our lives, Lord. Help. We need your wisdom. We need your strength. Help us to do that in our lives, Lord. We love you so much. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray.